The seven deadly sins theory is another common theory among fans. Unlike the time loop theory video, I actually have to put more of my spin on this because everyone assigns different sins to different entities. So I'll explain the base idea, but then I'll give you guys my interpretation of the theory. The basic version of this theory is that each overblot victim corresponds to one of Christianity's seven deadly sins. I've also seen some people assign sins to the dorms themselves, or the cause of the overblots as well, but we're focusing on the victims today. The sin assignment, as far as I've seen, isn't done to, like, foreshadow any future event or done to explain any aspect of the story. It's more of a little tie-in sort of thing that doesn't have a huge bearing on the plot. You know what I mean? It's just kind of there for fun, not for function. Like before, I'm not sure who, if anyone, was the first person to come up with this theory, or even what form it took. In case you aren't familiar with Christianity, I wish I was you. <laughs> Uh, the seven deadly sins are lists of quote-unquote reprehensible categories of moral misgivings in Christianity. And to uh, clarify, when I say Christianity, I mean Catholicism and then that weird brand of Christianity in the U.S. that fails to actually specify what they are. And when someone you meet says they're Christian and you ask them what kind, they just say Christian. And that conversation goes on for like 10 minutes and they won't tell you if they're Baptist or Lutheran or whatever, just Christian. But then again, I grew up in a town with a weird cult in it, so maybe my experiences aren't universal. The concept of the seven deadly sins originated from a Greek monk called Evagrius Ponticus as a list of eight no-nos. Later, it spread around Europe and Pope Gregory I revised it to the list we know today. There's also a sister list of seven heavenly virtues, which are good things in contrast with the sins, but those aren't really important to our conversation today. The sins, in no particular order, are as follows. Lust, greed, Pride, wrath, sloth, gluttony, and envy. There is, however, an old eighth deadly sin. I mean, there's technically two older sins that Pope Gregory I got rid of, acedia and vainglory. Vainglory was lumped in with pride, which I agree with since vainglory is just bragging. Acedia, however, is a little harder to define. It's basically depression, both the emotional feeling of depression and the lack of being able to do anything because you don't have the energy, which I'm sure all of us depressed bitches know way too well. Pope Gregory I lumped acedia in with sloth because he felt they were similar, but I personally disagree. I think acedia has enough differences and its own broadness that it should be its own category. I'm including acedia in my personal list because, let's be real, there's a theorized eighth overblot anyway, so we need another sin. I don't know if I would necessarily believe this was intentional planning on Tobos's part, but I do think it's fun to think about. So this is my list of sin assignments. Riddle is wrath, Leona is sloth, Azula is greed, Jamil is envy, Villa's pride, Idia is acedia, I'm guessing Malleus is lust, and if our theories about the prologue monster are correct, I think Grimm is gluttony. Wrath is anger. That's kind of it. And Riddle is a, a very angry person. I say that lovingly, as someone who has a quick temper myself. But it's very easy to piss him off, as shown with the rampant rule-breaking in the story, as well as Floyd's provocations. I don't really have anything else to say because Riddle, although a sun boy, is associated with anger. Sloth is, in modern times, laziness, but truthfully, there's more to it than that. It can be not doing what should be done, it's not fulfilling obligations, and what I think fits Leona the most is that it is, and I quote, ceasing to use the seven gifts of grace. Leona is repeatedly shown to be incredibly intelligent, and because those around him have failed him, he's stopped caring because he's constantly shunned. He stopped using what gifts he has, which I think falls in line with Sloth more than it does Acedia. Unlike Idia, Leona does care about his doormates and was shown to work hard in orchestrating the spell drive team's sabotage in order to secure Savannah Claw's victory. Thus, I think Leona fits Sloth far better than Acedia. Greed is the all-consuming desire for power, money, etc., etc., and Azula is a capitalist. I think that's self-explanatory. <laughs> okay, no, not exactly. Although capitalism and greed are bad fellows, there's more to it than that. Azula is repeatedly shown desiring others' abilities. We get this as early in the prologue, where he slips up and admits he wants Riddle's unique magic for himself. The majority of his contracts we've seen are for his own personal gain, gathering loads of special abilities and powers. And on top of these powers he gains, he also subjects the other party to do even more work for him. In Book 3, he not only takes magic from his victims, but he also forces them to work in the Mostro Lounge, squeezing them dry for everything they're worth. If that's not greed, I don't know what is. Envy is wanting what others have. Jamil longs for the position of house warden, and let's be real, he's more than qualified for it. But more than that, he longs to be able to live freely and not hold himself back because of a class system designed to keep people down. Kaleem is not just a person, but rather a symbol for this classism, and Jamil is envious that Kaleem has no restraints on him. Jamil's whole situation is fairly complex, and we could discuss the classism and the scaling sands for a while, but my bottom line is that Jamil longs to be free and to have the position of house warden which Kaleem has. So I would assign envy to Jamil. 
Pride is described as being so selfish and into yourself that you put yourself and your wants before others. In a nonsense way, Vil is pretty proud of himself and his accomplishments, which he should be. The dude's hella talented. But he also fits the sin side of it because, chapter 5 spoilers, his failure to be the fairest of them all leads him to taking down all his friends and himself in what I've seen as an attempted murder-suicide, which, that's kind of fair. Vil, when he overblocks, is still putting himself and his desires above others and actively endangers them, so I would assign him the sin of pride. Acedia is, as I mentioned earlier, basically depression. It can also mean apathy, carelessness, and if you're religious, lacking in your complete devotion to God. While I wouldn't be surprised if Idia has depression, he definitely is apathetic toward his position as a house warden. He also doesn't put a lot of effort into it. Acedia used to be a word to describe those, especially monks, who weren't giving their all to serve God, even though it was their job. Idia's situation seems to run alongside this, as he doesn't really give his all to working as a house warden. He does work hard when it comes to things he enjoys, like gaming or Ordo's maintenance, but for his actual job, he doesn't do much. But everything else is something he treats with apathy, and thus, I think he fits acedia. Lust is most commonly known as all-encompassing sexual desire, which, god, I fucking wish. I want Malleus to f- Anyway, lust isn't only sexual. It can also refer to the deep desire for power, wealth, material goods, honestly, kind of anything. Why this didn't get lumped in with greed or gluttony, I don't know. Wikipedia even points out that technically you can lust for food, and somehow it's different from gluttony. So would it really be so much of a stretch to say he lusts for a friend? Wait, no, no. <laughs> oh my god. He longs for someone to see him as an equal and not be intimidated by him. We know Malleus is a fairly lonely person, and while he does seem rather close to Lilia, Sebek, and Silver, in the end, they're his guardian and bodyguards. Malleus wants a true friend who loves him for him and doesn't let his royal status or power sway their opinion of him. We haven't gotten Chapter 7 yet in JP, so I can't say what will lead to Malleus' overblot, or even if he will overblot, but I think he will, and I think his intense desire for a true friend may play a part in it. Gluttony is mostly associated with food, but in reality, it just refers to having too much of one thing. Many religious figures have kind of really tied it to food. Like, when I was doing research, I would say 95% of the material I was looking at only talked about food, so like, okay, I guess. But I think we can all agree that if anyone would fit the role of a glutton, it's grim. He's always hounding people down for tuna cans, he's constantly hungry, and I'm pretty sure that 9 times out of 10, if we're getting some really long description about how food tastes, it's from Grimm. He loves food, and he keeps eating things he shouldn't, like block crystals. While some of these people you could argue a different sin actually caused the overblot, I think Grimm is a case of not only representing the sin, but that his overblot will most likely be caused by the sin. Spoilers for Chapter 6. But adjusting all these blot stones has shown it's not a good thing for Grimm, and I would be thoroughly shocked if he overblots the normal way, and it's not because of all the blot stones he's eaten. I think the Seven Deadly Sins theory is so popular because it's up for interpretation. You may agree with my assignments, but they're not the only ones out there, and because the sins can be a bit nebulous to begin with, it opens the door for a lot of interpretations. It also has no bearing on the plot, so it can't be something proven wrong because it's solely an opinion. It's a theory that perpetuates itself because if it can't be just and it's up for interpretation, everyone can have a say and it keeps the conversation going. And hell, like, I know a lot of people want an RSA arc. If we got that and we got overblots from that, we could easily go into Seven Heavenly Virtues theories. The Seven Deadly Sins theory has a lot of factors that make it not only interesting to discuss, but factors that keep it going. It's been here for a long time, and I don't see it dying out anytime soon. But yeah, that's my personal take on the Seven Deadly Sins theory and explaining the basics as much as I can. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do discuss your own ideas about this theory, be courteous and polite to each other. And with that, I will see you all a little later.